Greetings and welcome everyone. I'm Allison Schilling, the Senior Program Officer here at the Konkin Museum. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's forum with Professor and writer David Gessner on his new book, Quiet Desperation, Savage Delight, Sheltering with Thoreau in the Age of Crisis. The Concord Museum is home to the world's largest collection of objects related to Henry David Thoreau, numbering over 250 artifacts. A simple green desk made in Concord by a cabinet maker who probably charged $1 for it has become the cornerstone of the museum's collection and a treasured American icon as is the desk where Walden, universally acknowledged to be one of the greatest books of American literature, and Civil Disobedience, one of the most influential essays in the worldwide democratic tradition, were written. The museum is honored to be the steward of this national treasure. We are thrilled to continue the conversations and lessons that Thoreau brings us with leading scholars like today's speaker, who has spent a career blending a love of nature, humor, memoir, and environmentalism through his books and essays. David Gessner is the author of 12 award-winning books, including Leave It As It Is, A Journey Through Theodore Roosevelt's American Wilderness, which Robert Redford called a rallying cry in the age of climate change. His essays have been published in the New York Times Magazine, Outside, Sierra, Audubon, and numerous other publications. Previously, David taught environmental writing at Harvard University. Currently, he serves as chair of the creative writing department at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where he's also the founder and editor-in-chief of the prize-winning literary magazine, Ecotone. Today, we will hear about his more recent book, Quiet Desperation, Savage Delight, Sheltering with Thoreau in the Age of Crisis, for which one reviewer celebrated I ended up spending more time in the company of Gessner's latest work than I have with any other book I've ever read, save one, Walden. That's the highest compliment I could pay to any book or its writer. Our moderator this evening is Tom Putnam, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director of the Concord Museum. As always, we thank everyone who's tuned in to watch our program. If you wish to submit a question, please do so in the chat on YouTube, and I'll relay those to Tom. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Uh, thanks, Allison. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, tonight, David. Um, if Thoreau is your companion during uh, the pandemic, your book accompanied me on my vacation last week on the coast of Maine and in the White Mountains, and I felt like I was with a kindred spirit. Um, we thank you for this new volume in which the Concord Museum makes a cameo appearance. Um, and uh, I recommend the book highly to all of our uh, viewers this evening. Uh, Thoreau is the primary river running through the book, but your reading of him or others writing about him also leads us to learn quite a bit about you and uh, others, uh, many of whom are Thoreau's spiritual and intellectual heirs. So I hope our conversation over the next 40 minutes or so can weave some of those strands together, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So you open the book with a provocative, anecdote in which you recount uh, having once visited Walden Pond about 18 years ago uh, when your then baby daughter, uh, when with your then baby daughter, and you wanted to introduce her to the man who, quote, ruined her father's life. T tell us more uh, uh, about that uh, visit and uh, what you mean by that comment. Well, first, thank you, Tom, um, for having me. And thank you, Allison. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And I think the cameo that you mentioned must relate to Bob Thorson's book about the map. Is the map there? Um, of the, of I, the, of, yeah, uh, I should note what page it was on. It's, but, it's about, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It's no, about, no, but it, you, you definitely Thoreau, visit. Uh, Thoreau, Thoreau as, oh yeah, that's during the Emerson um, visit where I happened to be standing next yeah. to a bust of Emerson. Yeah. And, a guy had the same nose as the bust. <laughs> yeah. It turned out to be his great grandson. <laughs> uh, for Maine, I but, think. Yeah. And I think so. that um, you had, uh, I, I think you guys have the map, which is the scroll of all his river trips and his kind of, uh, which to me is at the essence of the whole excitement of, you know, when I do a book about, say, Ed Abbey and Wallace Stegner, 
I start by gathering maps and thinking about mm -hmm. the journey ahead. So, so yeah. But in terms of your question, how uh, Thoreau ruined my life, you know, I, I thought maybe I'd be a lawyer or a doctor or some kind of profession that my parents would smile about. <laughs> but I read him when I, like a lot of people, when I was 16 or 17 in Diane Mead's English class. And, you know, some people respond to that like they're being preached to and they're bored by reading it when they're forced to in high school English. Um, and some of us start picking at little things. And I said it was like a less musical, less stone version of listening to Pink Floyd, where suddenly I was <laughs> like, there is another way. And, and to hell with law school, hell, hell with um, you know, med school, I was going to think about becoming a writer and I started almost immediately keeping a journal. And, uh, and I'd always been somebody who liked to be out in the woods and be physically outdoors, but it kind of added a romantic sheen to that. And so it, it made me swerve in my life. And I, I think I quote the famous line of Thoreau's in that first paragraph, which is, or the second paragraph, which is, the life that men praise and call successful is but one kind, which when you're 16 or 17, if somebody says to you, you're like, yes, <laughs> yes, fight the power. And I had a very confident, aggressive, um, and ultimately loving dad, uh, who was a textile machinery executive in Worcester, Massachusetts, who when I got a 98 on a test said, well, what about the other two points? <laughs> and so Thoreau was an equally confident voice counteracting that businessman's voice. And too much information here, but my dad, I think, uh, had he was a history major in college. He had secret dreams of being a writer and was kind uh, of bullied by uh, his own dad into going to textile machinery. Um, he's never seen me publish a book because he died when he was 56, but I feel like in a weird way, I'm following his path as well. I'm going to revisit your uh, life as a young writer a little later, but uh, let's talk about the premise of the book. And I really enjoyed this quote. Uh, you write that you unwittingly prepared for the pandemic, having spent January and February of 2020 working obsessively on rebuilding your writing shack after it collapsed in the wake of Hurricane Florence, so that when the pandemic hit, it was as if you had been readying, this is, these are your words, to shelter in place. It was as if you had been given the answers to a test that everyone was soon going to have to take. Uh, right. So tell us a little bit more about your home um, in North Carolina and that shack and uh, the many hours you spent there during the pandemic. Sure. Um, in short, it was like I was cheating for a test because mm -hmm. Um, I was raring to go as far as sheltering in place. Um, I uh, have had geographic uncertainty throughout my life. I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, a story I won't go into, but I had testicular cancer in Worcester. We're back in my hometown when I was 30. And I got rejected by all the writing schools I applied to except one, which was in University of Colorado Boulder. And boy, Boulder was kind of the anti Worcester, and it lifted <laughs> me, and I fell in love with it, you know. And um, and I ended up once I moved to Boulder, writing a book about Massachusetts, about Cape Cod. Hmm. So I came back to Cape Cod and wrote a book about Boulder. So uh, whereas Thoreau said, you know, I have traveled a good deal in Concord, and he knew his place. I felt more like I called myself a polygamist of place. I didn't just marry one place. So finally, I moved back to the Cape in my 30s with my wife and wrote a book called Return of the Osprey that ended I Will Stay on Cape Cod Forever, which is how I got my job down here in North Carolina. Some faculty members read it, loved it, and asked me. And, and my daughter was, uh, my wife was pregnant with my daughter. And so suddenly, a salary and health insurance seemed like a good idea. So we moved down here and we first lived on the beach the first few years. And then we moved inland off of a tidal creek, Hewlett's Creek, also known as Dawson's Creek. And finally, at the age of 50, um, you know, obviously, as I've said, I've imitated Thoreau through journals and writing before. But finally, at 50, I finally built my cabin. And he was in his 20s, I was 50. 
And it really became this amazing, it made me love my new home in North Carolina on the, on the marsh. And I would come down every evening and, and write there and think there and bird watch there and maybe have a beer there. And during Hurricane Florence, it basically floated out to sea and filled to eight feet with water. And it was crazy. It was like up close and personal climate change. So it had been destroyed. And weirdly in January, right before the pandemic, I started to rebuild it. And I built it a lot nicer this time. I cedar shingled it and used my old carpentry skills. And I built an osprey platform uh, out on the marsh to look at. And weirdly, I was reading Laura Wall's great biography of Thoreau, um, which is going to be one of the few times I pronounce it correctly tonight. <laughs> I, I <can't laughs> Maybe I hold it again. Yeah. I've been doing it like since I was 16. So I was, I was weirdly ready to go. And, and w- during Allison's introduction, she said I was chair of the department. Well, I'm no longer chair of the department, which is a thrilling, wonderful thing. <laughs> but at that time, I was chair and, it, and I say in the book, it was like playing a game of space invaders where I'd answer emails and phone calls. And my whole life, I was the opposite of simplicity and Thoreauian simplicity. So suddenly with the pandemic, I had the shack. I didn't have to go into school. I was, these things were lifted off me. And of course I turned to our friend Henry and I wrote a piece about it early on, not thinking of it as a book at all you know, thinking of it as just like an essay I was going to write. And suddenly everything started to like sync together the way they weirdly do sometimes when you're writing a book where learning your backyard wasn't just what he was doing in the 1850s. It was what everybody was doing last year, right? And phenology, the study of phenomenon through the year was, uh, you know, when the birds return and when things bud was suddenly what everybody was doing to some extent and learning our backyards. And then there was the rewilding aspect where, um, you know, just looking at videos online, you'd see, I saw in my old hometown of Boulder or my old town of Boulder, two mountain lions walking down main street in a snowstorm. And so there was this excited moment. I mean, lots of horrible stuff was going on and I was well aware of it. My mom was in a nursing home. My sister was working in a hospital. A good friend died. So there was that. But there was also this kind of like, wait a second. This is a Thoreauvian moment. Uh, well, let's stay on this theme for a minute. Again, I'll quote some uh, words from your book. You write that um, Thoreau knew his words were not for everyone. He was the first to warn people not to follow his ideas unless they fit. Uh, talk to us about that. And also um, how for you COVID prompted you to live more of a Thoreauian lifestyle, you say, it was, quote, a time of enforced patience and enforced simplification. Yeah. Well, I think the funny thing is with Thoreau sometimes that, and I don't know if they're, I'm not trying to in any way insult our audience, who I (laughs) deeply respect, but where it's a little like my friends who were into the Grateful Dead in high school, where we get into him and we say, oh, I'm going to be like him, which certainly I did during this year, and I'm, I'm aware of my own hypocrisy. But the lesson, it seems to me, from him, quite obviously, is to be distinctly yourself. And yourself might not fit those clothes. I mean, there are things where I think he basically uh, temperamentally had like restraint and the ability to do without, which he extols as virtues, rightly, were part of his, how, what he was, how he was built. Um, I'm more of a creature of excess. I'm less so now that I'm getting older, which I'm happy to say. <laughs> but as a young person, I was a creature of excess, an ultimate Frisbee player, probably drank too much, uh, uh, all that. So it's, it's an effort to move in that direction, but that doesn't make the direction any less important. And So in terms of patience, the second part of your question, I have a part where I'm watching a great blue heron who's stalking a fish, waiting, 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 striking. And I start to think that sometimes patience is put forth as this kind of groovy virtue um, and an easy 
a Zen virtue, and, and I thought of it more as a discipline, something we, we have to work to do. And I remember when I wrote my book about ospreys, forcing myself to sit there and watch for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And it was really hard at first, the way people find meditation hard when they first do it. So that, all that to say, there's an aspect of discipline to patience. And I like when Thoreau talks about how when you go for a walk in the woods, if you're thinking village thoughts, you're not in the woods if you're not mm. thinking those thoughts. Mm. And if you're thinking about your things to do list, if you're checking your phone, you're not really there. And again, it's it's an art and a discipline to be really there. It's not a simple thing. The uh, first part of your response, I think, is a nice segue to the portion that I wanted you to read. I thought it might be nice to give our viewers a flavor of the book. So. It's the uh, paragraph that begins on the bottom of page 30, as with any great figure from the past. And uh, maybe if you could read to the end of that section. Sure thing. Sure thing. As with any great figure from the past, we can take what we want and throw the rest away, only wearing the clothes that fit us. I, feel, I find a lot from Thoreau that I feel I can put to use in these dire times, yet I wouldn't want to shelter in place with him. He would no doubt look down on my lax and slovenly ways. He wouldn't want to join me for my nightly cocktail hour down in the shack. Water is the only drink for a wise man, he preached. Whatever. I, a child of excess, will never pare down my life to the austere core that he whittled his down to. But at the risk of claiming to be learning those easy lessons that I discounted at the beginning of this book and with the foreknowledge that we will one day look back on this pandemic as just another event, as we couldn't believe we would come to regard 9-11, but have, I believe this period will mark a turning point for me at least. I'm not saying that I'm going to succeed, but I'm going to try to do with less. And I'm going to make even more of a commitment to turning my thoughts outward toward the natural world, toward the mystery, a mystery that includes the human but is not subsumed by it. I'm going to try to slow down my life and slow down time, knowing I will fail. I'm going to do the work I love and care about, not merely the work that the world rewards me for. And finally, I'm going to try to remember that the work is important for what it is, not how the world regards it. Thank you. Um, I thought I might read a couple of the row quotes and just have you respond to them. They're ones that uh, you go back to a number of times in the book and just, you know, why they jump out at you. So the first one is his quote, I love a broad margin to my life. What does that mean? Speak to you. Well, I'm going to be really honest about this one because I'm coming to the, I mean, one of the ironies, uh, I don't know if people know Scott Russell Sanders, but I think he's a writer in the Thoreauvian tradition who wrote a great book, Staying Put, about 30 years ago. And he wrote Staying Put, which meant he was out on the road doing book readings for the next year. Uh, and the book was, in a way, it was a uh, rebuttal to Kerouac's On the Road and saying the real radical thing that we can do now um, is go back to the idea of rooting down in one place. And Wendell Berry certainly has uh, uh, written about this idea and it goes back to Thoreau. Um, so the irony of my year in a way was once I got the idea of writing about this, yeah, I was slowing down somewhat, but I was also excited by the writing, which I think is a little bit of the small, I wouldn't call it a lie, but the small contradiction of Thoreau and Walden. Yes, he's slowing down, but you can hear it, you can feel the excitement in the sentences. So it's not like a dull, you know, slowing down. It's a, a, um, but then I followed it up with the book coming out, which was written so quickly, right? It's written during the pandemic. The last scene takes place with Jamie Raskin at the impeachment hearings and ends in March and comes out in June. So I was rush. I've been rushing about for the last mm -hmm. couple of months doing things like tonight. And weirdly, as it started to slow down in the last week or two, I'm living more like what I said I was living like in the book. And 
And I do think there's a balance for all of us. I think the know thyself lesson is so huge. Uh, there are some of us where if we slow down too much, if we did what exactly what Thoreau did, we would get supremely depressed <laughs> because we didn't have the stimulation in certain ways. So I think that's kind of the, you know, one of, one of the aspects is you, you figure, you gradually try desperately and you fail at it to figure yourself out and how you fit in this equation. And what he is as a model for me is kind of somebody who gave that a lot of thought and had the nerve, I won't say balls, because that's rude, to, um, to place, the, you know, place his life on the line once he decided this is the way I should be. Um, and so I, I'm sorry I lost track of the question as I was. Oh, it's just the comment. Uh, I love a broad margin to my life. The broad margin. I'd love to have more of it. Um, sometimes when I feel I have too much of it, I lose direction. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because of that dad who was the textile machinery executive back in Worcester. Um, <laughs> um, uh, let me jump to another. The you know re reliving it with you, and as you said, it's almost a contemporary contemporaneous book. Uh, but just uh, tell us a little bit more. Uh, you know, it's divided into months, um, and the contrivance that you have, which is kind of um, scary to relive. Uh, at the beginning of each chapter and the numbers that you report. Just, uh, well, while you're there, can you read the number on that first chapter? Because it's crazy when you think about it. It's like uh, 2,500 or something? Or? Uh, so this was March, and it's uh, global, global COVID-19 cases, 87,091 confirmed deaths, 2,979. That was right. in the very first month of March. So that was actually my editor's idea and uh, to have those at the beginning of each, set, each section, but the sections aren't chapters per se. They're, you know, they're, a, um, they're a section that has two or three chapters and it starts as we've already covered with kind of rediscovering Thoreau of talking about home and phenology and then rewilding but gradually, the interesting thing about it to me was, and I hadn't planned this at all, this is how the year went. Suddenly, as the year started to turn in May and June, it became intensely political with Black Lives Matter and protest marches. And um, it was perfect to have Thoreau as a sounding board then. So then throughout the year, I, I did a sneak attack on Walden, which we'll probably chat about later. Um, in, in August and the fall to have the elections was so intense to have this very internal private year also be public, this internal year also be so external. And that too was a, a Thoreau echo, right? Of, of somebody who goes into the woods, goes away from the world and yet brings back this very political worldly message. So it was a, it was a contrivance, as you say, and a way to give it shape. But it really was interesting to me because I was writing it as the year was happening. Mm -hmm. And as one finds when you're working on a novel or something, it's so bizarre how suddenly everything is clicking in your mind and fitting with it. And this was a crazy year to be writing about Thoreau because he couldn't have been more relevant. And of course, the numbers are worse even now. That your last chapter, March 2021, it's you know, 111 million cases and 2.64 million confirmed deaths, and it's just exactly a frightening exactly. thing. So, and for me, um, I turned 60 in March, which I can't even friggin' believe. <laughs> I've outlived Henry by what 16 years or something, and. Um, and I lost three people very close to me during mm -hmm. the year, none of them to COVID, though I did have COVID scares as a teacher and with my students. And it was a year about loss, too. And there's a great thorough line about when those close to you die, you know, how part of you dies. And it was a re... So there were a lot of positive lessons from the year, but there were some pretty uh, intense and... and difficult lessons too.
Um, again, I, you know, I, I'm not at all a thorough expert, but I'm somewhat familiar with the story. And I, um, so what I also appreciated in the book was I learned about some others and I thought I might turn to a few of those. And the, the one I found most interesting because I knew nothing about uh, Michelle de Montaigne, um, uh, who you write about, not as an anti-Thoreau, but I'll, I'll, I'll set you up with a couple of things that you say, but I mean, you quote from an essay, Pursuing Montaigne as Against Pursuing Thoreau by L. Rust Hills, who writes, what we could learn from Montaigne is how to live with ourselves as we are. What we learn from Thoreau is a much better way to live. It is, I suppose, a matter of two kinds of pleasure. Thoreau distinguished between pure and impure pleasure. Montaigne did not. Thoreau's vitality seems almost animal. Montaigne's indolence and sensuality seems so thoroughly human. And there's just one more quote that um, uh, it's easy to knock on Montaigne is that his philosophy leads to a kind of passivity. If we retreat as he counsels, we can never change the world. But you say what he contributes to the national dialogue was the opposite of extremism. And you quote one of his biographers, to suggest the 21st century has everything to gain from Montaigne's sense of life. It could use his sense of moderation, his love of sociability and courtesy, his suspension of judgment, and his subtle understanding of the psychological mechanisms involved in confrontation and conflict. So anyway, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about Montaigne and, and um, yeah. how you I'm think really about him. Happy brought, I'm really happy you brought that up, which no one else has done in the interviews I've done along the way. And for me, well, first of all, Joy Williams, who's an amazing fiction writer, was married to Rust Hills, who was the uh, Esquire editor for fiction and an editor of great writers. And Rust Hill wrote a book called How to Do Things Right, which is totally underappreciated and is Montanian in the sense that it's just his essays rambling this way and that. And that's where he compares Thoreau and Montaigne. And to me, Montaigne is the, is, I mean, it's weird because the two of them are kind of the patron saints of retreat. One goes to Emerson's land and Concord. The other goes to the family, you know, castle, basically, Chateau in, in France and retires and studies himself, writes these essays that meander and are about about him and creates the essay form. You know, that's mm -hmm. where the essay is born, um, not long before Shakespeare. In fact, Shakespeare lifts happily from some of Montaigne's writing. And to me, he's all about the self-accepting character who is, this is the way I am. In fact, you could argue, and I have, in an essay that I'll pro will probably be career suicide, <laughs> That, that canceling and the whole attacking of people is the opposite of the spirit of Montaigne. The spirit of Montaigne is here I am with my flaws. Here are my faults. You know, this is what I am as a human being, which we all obviously have. And um, he, it's almost preemptive strikes but by being honest, you, you accept his, his flaws. And also, he was just such an open character that during the civil wars in France, uh, uh, he kept his gates open in his chateau. Or, uh, people would come in and out, and he was so friendly and open that they'd, they'd um, not kill him, which was an <laughs> advantage. So uh, to me, they, there are a lot of borders with Thoreau. And, and one obvious one is what I would keep coming back to of being oneself being exactly oneself, but there's also a sociability. I mean, Thoreau was social, more social than most people admit, but he was this outgoing character who put himself on the page and just, he's not only, he's in the age of Trump, which was the original essay, it was the opposite of extremism. And this is how it is. Like this is how it is, is exactly the opposite of what Montaigne said. He said, I don't know how it is. I'm gonna figure it out as I go along. So I, I love the guy, um, probably shouldn't write another book about a dead white man at this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I, <laughs> I, I do love Montaigne. <laughs> two, two other deceased white men um, who 
you reference in the book. And, and there are a number of kind of mini biographies. And I wanted to just reference, um, you reference your uh, former college professor, Walter Jackson Bate. And um, I was introduced to him through someone else who you befriended, um, the late Bob Richardson, who yeah. I'm pr proud to say his last public speaking engagement was here at the Concord <laughs> Museum a year He's before. He's a great man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but talk a little bit maybe, and he also, I think he dedicates one of his books to his former professor, William Walter Jackson Bate. Tell us a little bit more about Walter Jackson Bate and the power and his belief, and I think yours, and the power of biography to touch our lives. Thank you for that great question. And I'm a huge Bob Richardson fan. And mm. yes, and he even wrote a small book about bait. Mm. It's got the word splendor in it. Um, maybe somebody in the chat will, um, will put the full title in there. Well, I think both of us were attracted to the same thing, other than his magnetic personality as a lecturer and all that. We were attracted to the idea that bait channeling Samuel Johnson believed that biography was, if not the greatest art, this great art, because what you read in biography and autobiography was what you could put to use in your own life. And what's better than that, right? You, you read about a life, whoever, whoever it is, and you say, this habit, this thing. And one of the themes with both of them uh, which is a theme that's fallen out of style, is greatness. And by greatness, they didn't mean like, you know, I'm the king of the world. They meant being magnanimous and a, a larger spirit. And they believed that through the contagion of reading people who come before us, we could expand ourselves. Now, is that true? I don't know. Are we genetically shut down and small are we smaller than that perhaps i just feel like for me having classes with walter jackson bait as a sophomore in night or as a first as a freshman in 1979 and then later uh is why i'm doing what i'm doing today and i really feel that reading biography is one of the mainstays of how i keep sane and how i continue to be a writer and I think Bob Richardson, more than almost anybody else I know, felt that too. And of course, mm -hmm. his life of the mind of Thoreau, which I'm going to say correctly again, uh, was an amazing book. Well, and the Emerson, and I think you talked oh, about Mind William, on Fire. Yeah. James. Yeah. What a great title, too. Yeah. That's what we all want. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's almost like place is another character uh, in your um, in this book. And uh, I thought uh, we won't go to, to all the things that happened there, but you write quite lovingly about Cape Cod. You mentioned that you grew up in Worcester, but your family had a summer home in Cape Cod and you spent some of your early years there. Um, um, and it's interesting because of course, Thoreau visited, visits Cape Cod, uh, which at that time is a kind of rougher tumbler um, place. Uh, uh, Thoreau describes it as a wild, rank place, and there's no flattery in it. But just tell us a little bit about why the Cape speaks to your soul and your years there. My first book was called A Wild, Rank Place, using that quote. And the interesting thing related to our conversation so far is that um, I use that. I still think you go to the Cape on one day in February and you see humpback whales or gannet diving, you can still get some of that raw, rank wildness. But the other thing that that sentence meant to me was my dad's blunt voice. And I wrote it, it was a memoir about the Cape in winter and his death. And so it combined those two things. And for me, what I started to learn, you know, I we haven't talked a lot about writing, and I know we've got a lot of things to cover, but one of the things the book is about is writing. And I've been teaching writing for 30 years, and, uh, and I believe that momentum and daily writing, uh, as invinced like in uh, Thoreau's journals or anybody's daily practice, is the secret. You know, you, you, you push the rock and keep the rock moving. So 
Uh, for, for me, uh, I worked in my 20s as a carpenter in Boston and on Cape Cod and as a bookstore clerk at Brookline Booksmith. And I was writing these big clunky novels where the characters quoted the road to each other and they were no good, but it was my apprenticeship basically. And the unlocking for me was to start to write about place. Mm -hmm. Place was a fascinating, almost magical thing where I would be walking down to the bluff on Cape Cod near where I lived in East Dennis and words would just come into my head as they never had before. In fact, I wrote one of my early essays called The Letter to a Neighbor about a trophy house that was up on this bluff I loved. And I had a, at the time a micro cassette recorder and I started to address the person. I said, you, are, you have just moved into this house and boom. An entire essay that I later published in Orion Magazine came out pretty much whole. I mean, there was some editing. And I felt like that the place had unlocked that. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, I find unlike Thoreau, well, Thoreau writes so well about Maine and about Cape Cod too. But for me, uh, the, the points of the compass are my current home in North Carolina, uh, Colorado and Utah and Cape Cod. And those have all unlocked books and things in me and place, I can't even, there's a magical component like nothing else in my writing life where it's unlocked things. And it's love of place. It's like you're in a beautiful place. You're looking at things. Suddenly you're not in your little hamster wheel brain. You're out into it. You're looking beyond yourself and you're excited. And then weirdly you get back to words and the words start to come. Uh, one of the things that seems to connect those places is also uh, your love of birds. And I wanted to read this quote, have you respond. I don't know how birds have become so entwined with my life or why birds have become one of my habitual subjects. That certainly wasn't the plan when I began to write, but it has happened. I've watched them from home and I follow them on odysseys down to the Gulf of Mexico and through the Rockies and the mountains of Cuba and the jungles of South America. Over the years, they've constantly lifted me out of my own life and they've expanded me, have made me larger. So maybe share with us a little bit where you've discovered this love of birding. And I never would have thought that would have happened, like you said. I, I never, that was not the plan. The plan was to be Hemingway. And I don't know, <laughs> did he write about birds? I'm sure he did a couple of times. Because uh -huh. when I was young, uh, nobody thought of creative nonfiction, the type of writing I do as, uh, as important the way fiction and writing big novels are and I didn't plan on it and I just I think it was I moved to Cape Cod after graduating from college in 1983 I was very privileged uh, and lucky to have our family house it had never been winterized I winterized it um, that year lived in it thought I was you know staying there as a temporary thing and that September I've looked back at the records was a incredibly warm, beautiful September and October. And, you know, millions of birds migrated through. And I was like, holy crap, this is spectacular. And I always say to people who think of birding as an effete, you know, delicate thing, it's like being a sports fan in a way. It's like all of a sudden there's all this action. It was sweeping through. And it, it was, as I, you know, as I said in that piece, it was one of the times where I got out of my own hamster wheel brain and just they, the best thing they do is take you out of yourself. And later I did a book about John Hay, the great Cape Cod nature writer. It's called the Prophet of Dry Hill. And John Hay, whose granddad had been the John Hay who had been with Abe Lincoln when he died and then been secretary of state with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, John Hay, who moved to Cape Cod in the fifties to Brewster said, how strange to have come through the whole century and seeing that the most important thing I'd witnessed were the birds. Or rather, it's the human mind when it looks at the birds and it finally goes beyond itself and it doesn't you know, get anchored in itself. Mm -hmm. So um, they, I mean, you, would, uh, you couldn't have told me in college that, that that would be what I ended up writing about, but I did. Um, we're getting some questions, so please send some more in. And um, one of our astute um, 
viewer is, is letting us know the name of the book is Splendor of Heart. That, um, Great little book. Um, I mean, I guess nowadays, I mean, I edit, you mentioned, uh, or Allison mentioned that I edited a journal called Ecotone, and we have a great diversity of people writing about the natural world, and that is wonderful. So um, Walter Jackson Bate might fall in the old school of, you know, the old days, old school professor, but he was so generous and big hearted. And he, he was a biographer who, the reason he was a biographer is empathy was his great skill. Mm -hmm. There was a famous story that he started to cough hard during the end of writing Keats's life because Keats had, Keats had tuberculosis, <laughs> you know, he, he, and empathy is a great, you know, that's mm -hmm. one of the great talents. And that's one of the jokes about the current situation that we don't extend our empathy in all directions. Uh, I'll also recommend to our viewers, I read your essay, Those Who Write Teach, um, which we, you're right, we haven't talked too much about writing, but it's a lovely piece and about the pull that uh, professional writers like you who then teach have, and for some the teaching you know, informs their and inspires their writing. For others, it sucks some of their energy out. But um, the piece is also about your transition, as you've alluded to, from Cape Cod to living in North Carolina. And I, I thought, um, because this kind of social justice message is an important one, both just Thoreau and to your writing, that I, I actually wanted you to take a minute and tell us about this historical moment in the history of Wilmington, North Carolina, which you describe as a a coup d'etat. Uh, so many of us are just learning about the Tulsa race riots, and this is a similar story that isn't well known. And I thought I'd give you a moment to to share what happened. I could be wrong, but I just looked at the, um, who won the Pulitzers, and I think that the Wilmington Lie might have won for general uh -huh. fiction, which I mentioned in the book. Yeah. So basically, in 1898, the town I now live in was majority black and was also culturally mixed because uh, partly we're a port city. So there were a lot of European influences and many African-Americans uh, came to this town as kind of a, a place that was more accepting. And we had policemen, legislators. It was, it was a more mixed town. And of course, Whitey didn't like that. So there was this violent overthrow during election week of 1898. Um, and that violent overthrow, which left at least 80 people dead and uh, bodies floating in the Cape Fear River, um, uh, continues to this day to some extent. There's been, the town totally was turned the other direction. And, so that's the town I live in, and that's the history that of, of the place I moved to. Um, to make a somewhat jarring turn, I will say that moving here, which on you know, from a Thoreau Wendell Berry point of view, is like leaving your beloved place, uh, was one of the best things I've ever done for my own career hmm. because it forced me to look at different things and not. I mean, because you can only write so many Waldens. If you live on Cape Cod or in Boulder, Colorado, there's only so many books you can write that say, boy, I love this place. So the unsettling of my settled life was a very positive artistic thing. Even if, you know, even if I might have been happier being Thoreau Jr. or John Hay Jr. on Cape Cod. <laughs> so here's a question from the audience. And again, we welcome others. Earlier, you wrote a terrific book about Edward Abbey and Wallace Stegner, to other giants. Uh, do they also have lessons for us in this time of the pandemic? Well, you know, I think they do. And the interesting thing is that Ed Abbey would be the poster boy for the Me Too movement and, and, and is really <laughs> controversial. He's like the road of the 10th power in terms of, um, and in terms of immigration and stuff. But despite that, and that's a very valid, I mean, he's very takedownable in this day and age. Uh, his modernizing of Thoreau, um, saying you can still do this, you can still um, 
uh, find your place. His place was Arches in Utah, not Concord. Um, is still pretty exciting. And also, he didn't give a shit. <laughs> like if he 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 would respond to um, being taken down, like he always did. Just like, okay, well, I'm gonna live out here in my trailer and drink my beer. And uh, but Stegner is a more complicated and to me deeper figure. Um, that was my big discovery out west was Stegner, who thought so brilliantly about his region and the aridity and the fires and everything that's going on right now. He, he thought about, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And when I moved back east, I felt like I took Stegner with me and as a, a mentor. And we talked earlier about uh, part of my trip for this book was going out west and everything was smoke everywhere, Nevada, Colorado, Utah. And I witnessed a flash flood at, at Abby's um, friend, Ken Slight, who's seldom seen Smith in the Monkey Wrench game. A flash flood coming down there. I drove to Paradise, um, California, as they were evacuating again. And I just was like, holy crap, we are living in the future. We're living in the, uh, in the, the words that Bill McKibben predicted in End of Nature 30 years ago. And I think that adds a whole urgency to what we're talking about. Um, and uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who Walter Jackson Bain always quoted, uh, talked about inert ideas. There are some ideas that are just theoretical ideas. This is a real, alive idea that here we are. Uh, it's not just the pandemic. It's the larger crises that are, that are here, right in our faces. So what do we do? Can we do anything? Do we throw up our hands? Um, here it is. I'm and sorry. You're, you're right about, and perhaps you can talk a little bit about how you see it affecting your own daughter and your students and who experience it perhaps differently than those of us who are close to our 60s, but you know. Yeah, the beginning you're only close. I, I, I admire you for only being close to your 60s. <laughs> <laughs> but don't, don't go here, it's not good. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, for me, the big awakening in terms of climate change wasn't just seeing the water rise and everything. It was seeing my students taking it so personally as anxiety attacks and then seeing my daughter do the same. And so I'm fiddling with this new book, which is the basic theme is the end of the world, which isn't much fun. Um, but one of the things I want to do is say, I had my daughter when I was 42. Let's flip ahead 42 years and say, what's the world going to be like in 42 years? Uh, are we able to, are we going to be able to really change our behavior? I'm not sure we are. Uh, so it's a scary thing. Uh, some of our viewers may be familiar, but others may not. You talk about how scientists are using Thoreau's journals to study climate change. Maybe just for those who aren't familiar with that. Well, I, I mentioned phenology kind of offhandedly, and it's an idea that has really kind of ignited my thinking, and I try to do it wherever I am, whether it's Cape Cod, Colorado, or Carolina, and it's noticing when phenomenon change and how the world moves around. So, for instance, when I lived on the Cape the last time with my wife, I was walking down the beach in October, maybe September, I can't remember. And there was something about the air and the temperature. And I got home and I said, the seals should be back home, home soon. Mm. And the next day they were on the rocks because mm. they migrate to Maine in the summer. And I came home like, woohoo! It's like I'd want, you know, gotten a job promotion. <laughs> and to me, that was really cool that my, I was getting more in sync mm -hmm. in the seasons in that place. And Thoreau clearly did that constantly. And currently climate scientists use his journals to say, when do things flower and conquer? And when, do the leaf, when does the leaf out come? And surprise, surprise, it you know, comes a lot earlier because it's a lot hotter. So. Thoreau is being used for, for climate study, and um, which makes sense when you keep a record like that. 
And, and I, I should add that though most of my classes were online last year, I did have a class with grad students in the fall where we went out to one place on the beach where green herons nested and there were black skimmers on the beach that we went all every week and we all took note. And I did a kind of thing where each of them took one aspect of the beach, geology, birds, um, sand development. And we tried to learn that one square mile, which was certainly Thoreau inspired. Uh, this is a complicated topic we won't be able to do justice to it, but um, Thoreau is known for his ability to find native arrowheads on his walks throughout Concord. And we actually have many of them in our collection. You write about his relationship with his two Penobscot guides when he was in the Maine woods and hiking uh, Katahdin. Uh, if you could just comment on how your understanding of how that experience transfigured him. Well, I think that So I think that some of the things that we are being we are being told about white colonial behavior are very helpful right now. And one is that, for instance, I'm inclined to say he was the first writer who wrote, well, first, I don't know, first white writer. I mean, these are so many of Thoreau's ideas are native ideas. And it takes him a while to kind of circle back and say, yeah, this thing I'm saying has been done before on the same landscape by, by people for thousands of years. And, you know, not all of them were great philosophers or great whatever, but um, it was, um, it was a, I mean, he had an instinctive early sense of knowing that the land had been in, deeply inhabited before, but I think it grows deeper as, as time moves on. And I think we're wrong to separate these things. If we have someone doing that, whatever their background, that's a great thing. And mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time in Utah and writing about Bears Ears National Monument and with Navajo and, and it's like, um, I in no way want to appropriate or be, you know, come, coming in from the outside, but I do want to learn because the, in my interests and his interests in learning about nature and getting more deeply rooted in place, uh, who better to learn from than people who did that for thousands of years. So I think uh, the short version is it's really interesting to follow his, um, evolution toward that. You've alluded to this, I've, I've just a couple uh, more questions, again, based on quotes in the book, towards the end of the book. Um, and uh, as you said, obviously the backdrop to the book is the um, political things that were happening during the pandemic, which we all lived through. Um, and you, your quote, which you referenced earlier, but maybe talk a little bit more about about it here. What has surprised me over this last year is that in this time of withdrawal, I have felt as never before that my personal life, my interior world is interlaced with the public external world. The two seem to pulse and move in unison like dancers moving in step. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, there's a scene that I mentioned to you earlier before we got on about my, my daughter, doing a Black Lives Matter protest. And she is out there and there's this kind of creepy guy who says, shut the hell up to the high school students who are doing the protests. And I'm kind of lurking like a secret service fan in the background uh, near him. And, and then I start to think after we're safe and he leaves and he's ushered off by a policeman that how interesting that the ideas in our streets were in part formed by somebody going into the woods and thinking by themselves. And uh, there's a, I end it with a long quote from Martin Luther King where he says, no one more than uh, Henry David Thoreau has influenced what I've done with the civil rights movement. And uh, he showed how uh, 
we should have no patience with injustice. And so it's a great quote from his autobiography. But the thing that's interesting to me is the idea that to really have thoughtful action in the world, we have to withdraw from the world somewhat and be thoughtful. And that might not mean going to the woods in a cabin. It might mean taking a walk or thinking, but not just being reflexive and you know, just so much of what we hear, not just on the in the media, but even in the writing, is just like that day, that day. And Thoreau to me seems the opposite of that, where it's I'm gonna think this out and work it through, and then I'm gonna bring it to you. And it could have gone another way. I mean, he was a lucky man in the sense that certain scholars and Emerson's eulogy led to his posthumous reputation that we listen to him still, but um, but we do. And that's kind of interesting that this supposedly isolated figure is still important in our political thought. Uh, I thought I uh, turned to a quote uh, from the very last page of the book. Um, and it, again, it's this, twin pull between, um, I think E.B. White once said, the desire to uh, improve the world and the desire to enjoy it. Um, but That's a great right. essay. Yeah. Um, uh, so you suggest that uh, Thoreau's most obvious lesson is not to be like him, but to take a lifelong task and passion, the art of being exactly like yourself. To, to take as a lifelong task and passion, the art of being exactly like yourself. So in so doing, you, David, take heart from his example. And here again, I'll quote from the book, quote, of how much Thoreau buffeted like all of us by turmoil and tragedy, simply enjoyed being alive on this planet. The two, it turns out, are not mutually exclusive. It seems like a somewhat hopeful uh, way to both end the book and to end this conversation you kind of talk about how you resolve those tensions in your own life. Well, it's interesting that we're ending this way because before we got on, you know, uh, I mentioned how depressing driving through the West was with the fires and the floods and all that. And I do feel like there's an aspect uh, where we need to fight like hell. Uh, we're in a bad place. Uh, I don't want my daughter in 42 years to be in some kind of 120 degree you know, boiler. Um, but on the other hand, we're alive in this moment. And I think that's sometimes something as obvious as it is that people forget. And I'd like to enjoy my period on planet Earth. You know what, my idea of enjoyment might be slightly different than Thoreau's, but, uh, and I think we can have those two contradictory things. Another of my favorite quotes, which I um, use earlier in the book is James Baldwin, uh, where he talks about, he's talking about race, but I apply it to environmentalism, which is the ability to both abhor injustice and fight against it, and to accept the kind of messy carnival that life is. And I think those that what Keats called negative capability, the ability to keep those two things in mind at once is a healthy and decent way to get through life, basically. I wish I had said basically, it would have been a better ending if I hadn't said basically. <laughs> uh, let me close with one other uh, lovely quote uh, from the book. Uh, these are your words. And while this shack might appear flimsy to others, I believe it offers me some real protection. It is here that I find my sheltering grass, the place I can turn back to after letting go with my brash and bold cry. So we thank you, David Gessner, for your own interpretation of the life and works of Henry David Thoreau and others, uh, and especially for your own brash and bold cry, which speaks so powerfully to us in these difficult times. Thank you for being thank here you. with us this evening. And thank you for your deep and thoughtful reading of the book. I really appreciate it. Sure. It's a pleasure. Uh, we thank all of you for joining us um, and hope you'll join us. I think our next forum is uh, 
later in August uh, about this interesting protest that happened in Concord in uh, 1972, protesting the Vietnam War. So we will be once again looking at how Concord serves as a, uh, a beacon uh, to those who are confronting the injustices of their time. Thank it's you very much. Book. Okay, good. Uh, I'll, we'll say good evening to our uh, viewers. Uh, thank you for joining us.